Oh, oh, this is a member of the Boys of Reason. I'm coming at you today, and we're not, I now, as a peer advocate, I'm going to look at the movie A Thousand Clowns with Jason Robards. Um, this isn't one of those movies that was made. This is a movie made back in 1965 that that kind of fell into obscurity. Um, you talk about it today, people have no idea what you're talking about. However, the movie was way ahead of its time, and it was one of the first cinematic depictions of the child care foster system, and and how um, and the the gut wrenching harsh realities of a CPS worker coming into your life, and how and um, and the realities of the reality of what would happen if um, of how easy it was to lose custody of a child. In the movie, Jason Robards is taking care of his nephew, and is um is um is uh, is a comedian and a, and a career performer. That's a, that that's that's his way of making a living. However, he kind of fell on hard times, and is not making so much money. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna watch watch it from a peer advocate standpoint, and I'm gonna sit there, and I'm gonna let you, the audience, hear what's going on. And then I'm gonna point out, and I'm then gonna describe. Being as I don't know how to do the whole split screen side thing like um like like um uh, <laughs> like other people do, um, if I knew how to do that, I would have done it a long time ago. But let's watch the film anyway. Let's watch the clip from this anyway, and see um from a, from a peer advocate standpoint, everything that he's doing wrong or everything that's going on well, to to kind of describe what's going on. A thousand clowns is now officially being advocated. Okay, let me stop it right there. Um, Murray, played by Jason Robards, is telling um, is basically um, is sitting there where um, I forgot the actress. Hold on, pull up this ca the cast list so I can give you an idea, better idea as to what we're, what we're dealing with. Okay. We go. Um, Barbara Hara, um, the, the, um, the the child Ser protective services worker, um, played by actress Barbara Harris. And wow, that's and that and then um, the nephew was played by Barry Gordon. That's wow. Anyway, um. What I'm seeing in the scene is, from an advocate standpoint, um, basically Murray is doing everything wrong that you do not do in front of a child services worker. He is not taking the situation seriously. He's not dealing. He's not dealing with the reality that this is this person does work for a department Department of Social Services. That she does have the power to um, to walk in there. Um, 
take all of his nephew's belongings and leave it and leave with the with the child where he would most likely never see the kid again. And the family court system back then was very one sided. All they were interested in um, they weren't interest interested in doing the jobs properly at all. All they were interested in is meeting their meeting their quota. You were lucky back then if you had any workers that really cared. Um, but at the same time, back then, she also has a very accurate depiction in the 1960s of what a child services worker was like. Um, they're still pioneers. They were still very naive as to how abusive people could be behind closed doors. There was a lot of things going on back then that people really didn't know. Um, but I think every MB, even, even the child, even his nephew, the child, which has to be between like 12 and 14, understands the, um, the, the rhetoric and the reality of the situation that, you know, if she uh, sits there and says, I'm taking him with me and you're not, um, I'm, I'm taking with me, most likely he would end up in a reform school or a foster home where um, it would be, it would not so much be an ideal foster home, but it would be whatever, whatever foster home they could find for him. Um, and back then, foster homes were a living nightmare. If you, if you, if you, to get put in foster care with a family that, um, with a complete stranger, was was a crapshoot. If you're lucky, you had you, you got three high, three three square meals and somewhere to sleep. If you're not lucky, uh, the people neglected you, beat on you, put you in all kinds of screw up situations. Um, the, um, the the odds of a kid back then dying in foster care was up greater. So really, I mean, this kid understands that you know his very his very livelihood and his ability to have an, um, um, a family member or someone he's related to biologically taking care of him and raising him is now resting in the balance of Murray actually getting his act together and not and finding a decent finding a normal boring job and actually taking care of him once once and for all, which he's clearly not doing right now. He's sitting there playing playing guitar and has the kid playing ukulele. Um, so the nephew is humoring him and basically he's saying, okay, fine, since we insist on playing the song, well, yes, sir, that's my baby. Um, but the kid clearly takes a step and says, I'm bringing my, I'm going over to Mrs. whatever the neighbor's name is, because he already knows that in order to keep her from taking him and bring him to a reform to a reform school or a much or back then it was in a, or a hospital, or a psychiatric hospital, because back then they didn't have any temporary respite homes. When you got put in the foster care system, they took you to a hospital. Ouch. Um, whether you were mentally ill or not, because they had to put you somewhere. It was either that, or they put you in a jail. They put you in a, in a private holding jail cell um, at the police station, and they weren't about to put a kid in, inside a holding jail cell. Especially all the kids are guilty of is having um, having a parent that's basically committing. Um, Roundabout, a roundabout form of child neglect, and right now he's committing child neglect. And, uh, and somebody should, should, I mean, clearly, if I could say anything to um, to this guy, is that you are committing massive child neglect, and what you're doing is stupid and wrong. Um, he should not be playing the guitar at all. He should be. If she's going to sit there and invest time in visiting with him to see exactly if he's trying to get his act together and get a proper job and take care of his nephew. She should be at least. Telling him, okay, do you understand the reality of the situation? So he's wrong, but she's also equally as wrong for humoring the upper, entertaining this stupid and irresponsible behavior. She's obligated, but she's she has a, she has a, um she's a moral and um an ethical obligation to tell him, do you understand the gravity of the situation? Of course, this is uh, this is 1965, and back then they weren't obligated to do shit. Since then, there's, um, the the HIPAA laws and the and the, and the laws of um, of, um, of and uh, and the basic laws of ethical um, ethical humane practices and human services have been updated, where um, a child services worker is um, is mandated by law to tell someone. And uh, to give someone a full, a full idea as to the gravity, to the to the major gravity of the situation. That way, things like this can, this this won't happen. So yeah, I give it um, a historical accuracy for you know back then they didn't have a lot of mandates that, that they do today. But if this were to happen today, um, someone like me would have gone in his house, taken his guitar, smashed it on the floor, and said, "Okay, you need to stop this shit." I would have told him, Murray, you need to get your act together. 
And I would have said to him, your nephew is going to end up in a reform school or a foster home where they don't really know him. And being as it's, it's 1965, there's the odds of him ending up in a very shitty foster home where he would most likely be abused and mistreated by complete strangers is great. And that kid, the kid knows it. You're all he's got. Being as you're all he's got, you really need to get your shit together. So, yeah, really um, what I'm seeing right here is that Murray is not a fit parent. He's very irresponsible, and he's not really getting – he's not really understanding the reality of the situation. The kid does. The kid knows that, you know, I'm a kid. I know I have no say in what happens to me. In fact, most kids who are in situations like this are very well grounded in reality, and they have a very clear understanding of the world. So for a kid to deal with the child with the foster care system or child services from, from a very early age, they and well into adulthood, they have a grounding sense of common sense. They have a grounding sense of reality, and they have an overly abundant amount, abundant amount of common sense. Let's see more. Somebody yeah, <laughs> again, if I could show you the, the image right now, the child services worker is looking at him with disgust and, and really like she has this disturbed look on her face like, dude, what the hell's wrong with this guy? While he's just playing the, the guitar going, yes, yeah, so that's my baby. So yeah, from what I'm seeing right now, it's the whole situation is very insane. And I mean, he's clear showing uh, clear signs of denial, mental illness, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So, from a peer advocate standpoint, it would be I, I pretty much if I were to step in, I'd be dealing with 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 with, with Murray, not the not, not the nephew, but I would be telling him the reality, like, dude, you need to be on medication, you need to get therapy, you need to get help, <laughs> you need to wrap your mind around, around the fact that guess what, you're not allowed to be a performer anymore, you're not a comedian, you're not a songwriter. You're not an, inter an entertainer. You're going to have to get a normal, boring, mundane, the fucked up job that you're going to hate. That's going to break your back and wear you thin. It's going to be cranky. But you have to kind of, you have to you kind of, it's, this may be America, but the child care system, the, the foster care system is a communist, is basically a communist run um, system. It's you do it our way or we take your kid. We are, we're allowing you to keep the kid at our, at our pleasure because up until this point, we've entertained this shit. Well, we, we, we've been entertaining this shit a long time. It's what they don't tell you, and, I'm, and I'm, unfortunately, in situations like this, it's what they don't tell you is what works totally against you. What they're not telling you is that if you read between the lines, they say, well, we'll give you time, or they're smiling. The more she's smiling and sitting there, her body language says, I'm entertaining this shit and I'm putting up with it because honestly um, I find it mildly amusing but what's even more which what's, what's sadder and sicker is it, um, it's more what I'm trying to do is put off the inevitable which is me taking that kid um, and I'm out of your out of your custody and you're you probably never seeing the kid again to where he, that kid that poor kid's gonna be heartbroken because you can't sit there and grow up and be an adult and get your shit together so yeah, I give this about a 95 as far as accuracy, as far as the the, the, um, the the foster care worker. But the part that I don't I don't agree with that's not accurate is that she's sitting there entertaining his behavior, sitting there with the guitar and playing the music. Because any other any other any other um, CPS work, child protective services worker would have got up and said, you know what, I'm out of here. If I come back, I'm come back with my supervisor and the police, and I'm taking that kid. Because any any behavior like that off the top off the bat would have been would have been clearly seen as unstable, mentally ill. There's something wrong with him. Um, any real worker would have sat there and taken the kid right away. So yeah, um, but but then again, this is the 1960s where they were still pioneers. There was a lot they didn't know about the foster care system back then. And this is made about ten. To 11 years before Boxer Floyd Patterson became a foster parent, so even back then it was like the odds of you finding a decent foster home, foster home, were slim to none. So let's see more. Hey, I don't want to go, Charlie, baby. Have a great trip. Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to stop right there. What I'm seeing right here is that he's now hanging out with the worker outside uh, dealing with the kid. And basically, this is something that a lot of child services workers do. They'll hang out with the parent and kind of follow them around to see exactly what their day-to-day -day habits are. It's called it's it's called the life it's called an honest life day-to-day -day assessment. Um, they see exactly what their day-to-day -day habits are, what they do with their free time, how much time and effort they invest in getting a proper job. Are they getting therapy? These are things that you're supposed to do. Um, and what I'm seeing right here, the one thing that's not accurate is that she's not. She's basically buying into. She's allowing him to suck her in and manipulate her because they're not too far apart in age. You know, they're they're within the same age bracket to date, which is wrong. Um, She's approaching the situation by herself, so she should have brought in the worker with her to kind of sit there and squash that. He's being he's basically hitting on her and romancing her, and he's crossing a lot of ethical boundaries, which should not be happening whatsoever. Um, this is a classic bipolar um, bipolar behavior trait to sit there and manipulate somebody and kind of using your flamboyant, you know, manic high to kind of sit there and even sucker the most intelligent people into your little universe. This happens all the time, even today. It happened back in 1965 and it happens today in 2019. Um, it's very disturbing. It's not funny. And situations like this just get, get progressively worse. And I can already see the writing on the wall that her inability to recognize the, how unstable this man really is, is what's going to be, it's, um, is going to make her job all that much harder down the road when she has to take that kid out of his custody. So either way, I'm giving this a, a pretty much a negative 10 on the accuracy level but, um, as far as what a real worker would do because there, I mean, there's a lot of different boundaries and, um, Guidelines that you're not that you're that you're, you're morally and ethically obligated to follow when working in this line of work because social workers are able therapists as well. So really, she could lose her license to practice. She could get fired from her job, and she I mean, she could possibly face up to ten days in jail. Um, him, he could lose custody of the kid. He could be hospitalized. He could be locked. He could be mandated to a hospital up to, up to ninety days until they could properly put him on a medication that makes him not behave this way. Um, and the odds of him getting violent and losing his temper are great, so they'll end up, they'll end up holding him down and be and I'll be overbearing on on on, the, on him no matter what. Either way, this is a very explosive situation that's going to get progressively worse. Um, but yeah, and this movie is way ahead of its time, and this is a great outline for people ad for peer advocates. Um, I'm surprised this movie wasn't used during my training because. Honestly, this movie should show should have been used during my during, during our during my my advocacy training. But yeah, this is <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of people like this. I've come across people who I've adv advocated for who I've helped in situations like this. Anyway, let's see a little bit more. <laughs> oh, by the way, yes, by the way. When we meet, somebody will say, Yes, sir, that's my baby love, sir. I don't mean baby. Yes, sir, that's my baby now. Wow. Um, again, the fact that she's being all buddy buddy and let, allowing him to manipulate her and kind of charm his way into getting her to let her guard down basically means that she's gonna, she's she's on the verge of losing her job, and the situation's getting progressively worse and worse. Either way, this is. Um, I've seen this happen a million times before. Uh, not a million, but I'm, I'm exaggerating. But no, just 
the reality is this happens more and more often than not. You have people, you have people stuck in a situation where the human services, any form branch of human services get involved, whether it be mental health workers or whether it be you know a child services worker or anybody in general. Um, they're put in a very awkward position of they're put in a very awkward position of having this of having to, of having to tell the person, look, you don't get your act together. You're going to lose everything. And holy crap, I managed to find the full movie. This is great. Now, let's see another scene with Murray right now. Oh, what's so funny? I scared myself. Mm. All right, I've long been aware... I've long been aware that you don't respect me so much. No? I suppose there are a lot of brothers who don't get along, but in reference to us and considering the factors, it sounds like a contract, doesn't it? Unfortunately for you, Murray, you want to be a hero. If maybe a fella falls into the lake, you can jump in and save him. There's still that kind of stuff. So who gets opportunities like that in the midtown Manhattan with all that traffic? I'm willing to deal with the available world. I don't choose to shake it up, but to live with it. There's the people who spill things, and there's the people who get spilled on, and I don't choose to notice the stains. I have a wife, and I have children, and business, like they say, is business. I'm not an exceptional man, so it's possible for me to stay with things the way they are. I'm lucky. I'm gifted. I have a talent for surrender. And I'm at peace. But you? Oh, you're cursed. And I like you. All right? So it makes me sad. You don't have the gift, and I can see the torture of it. All I can do is worry for you, but I will not worry for myself. You can't convince me that I'm one of the bad guys. I get up. I go, I lie a little, I peddle a little, I watch the rules, I talk the talk. We fellows have those offices high up there so that we can catch the wind and go with it, however it blows. But, and I'm not going to apologize for it, I take pride. I am the best possible Arnold Burns. All right, let's stop right there. Basically, it's his brother's telling him that, you know, I unlike you, um, I know I'm not going to be the next Rembrandt. I'm not going to be the next Mozart. I'm not going to be the next, you know, Andrew Carnegie. I'm not going to be any of those things. I'm an ordinary, dull, boring man who has an old, ordinary, dull, boring job. And um, that's my life. I go to work. I come home. I've accepted my place in the world, and this is how, I mean, and the quicker you can surrender and just give up everything about you, because the, the, the harsh reality is this is a part of being a parent and be, and having and having custody over any child is that you cannot hold on to um, hold on to your to your pipe dreams and your goals and aspirations. And he has a valid point there. You know, back then, you know, um, the entertainment industry was only accessible to those with um, those who were single and who had the means of not having children and who uh, who didn't have custody over a child. And there's no way he, there's no way Murray could take the kid and move to California because California was only for single people who were um, back then were always only. There was no viable resources for full families to get to to break into the entertainment entertainment industry. Maybe today that could happen. I mean, I've heard stories of men with 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 a wife and kids and full out families actually becoming famous actors. Um, one of the, one of the actors from the Harry Potter movie, you know, he got discovered at 35 years old when he had wife and kids and everything, and now his son now has broken into acting. So you know. Um, that's a success story right there. But back in 1965, there was none of that. You know, I mean, America basically claimed it now to be nothing like the communists. But like the communists, it's you. It was this is your place. You accepted it, or we made you pay the price.
yeah, you didn't go to jail for it, but the system could legally take everything else away from you in the process. So I'm giving this one a very, a very high accuracy rate because back then this is what loved ones were telling telling each other. Like, you're my brother. I want to see you succeed. I don't want to see my nephew taken away from you. This sucks. <laughs> um, you really, really need to kind of wake up and grow up. And he's basically trying to tell Murray, grow up. So, yeah, I've seen this discussion happen a lot of times with people. I've had to tell people this myself. I've had to say that. I've had to have that same talk with um, with friends and loved ones and other people. I had to sit there and give it to them straight and shoot straight from the hip. And it's not fun. <laughs> um you could tell he's taking no pleasure in having to tell, having to kind of give it to Murray square between the eyes. All right, let's see another scene. I picked my permanent first name like we said. Just go on calling yourself Nick. You've been using that one the longest. Well, Nick is a name for a short person. Since I'm a short person, I don't believe I should put a lot of attention on it. What do you mean? Where'd you get the idea? You were short. And people who are taller than I am. It's ridiculous. Sure. Up there, it's ridiculous. Well, from down here where I am, it's not so ridiculous. You know, half the girls in my class are taller than me. Especially Susan Bookwall. Nick, you happen to be a nice medium height for your age. So how is it everybody crouches over when I'm around? Because you're a kid. Look, you come from a fairly tall family. Now, the next couple of years, you're going to grow like crazy. Really, every day you're getting bigger. And so is Susan Bookwalter. So, for a couple of months, I've been considering various tall names. Then I thought about just picking any name, putting Captain in front of it, so it'd jack it up a little. But I really didn't like that either. But then, last week I finally and really decided, and I took out a new library card to see how it looks. And today I figured I'd make it definite and official. It's my library card. Well, no, that's the whole thing. It's mine. It says Murray Burns on it. Well, yeah, that's the name that I picked. So I took out a new card to see how it looks and make it official. Hey, Murray, baby, don't jump! Hey, brother, don't jump on these kids! Hey! Hey! Okay. Wow. This is one of those heartbreaking parent-to-child talks. All right, I've, this is no, um, this is another one that's hard to hard to tackle. Um, what's going on here is Murray's having to deal with the harsh rea emotional realities of trying to steer this kid in the right direction, actually raising a kid. Um, he's a performer. He's a comedian. He's a songwriter. He's an he's an entertainer. Um, the idea of trying to sit there and tell tell him tell his nephew, um, look, it's okay. You're you know you're you're only 12 years old. You know you're not going to sit there and see and see height and puberty hasn't really and puberty's puberty is still not done with you. You just got to give it time. You know, um, for him to sit there and surrender to the idea to to surrender to um to doing the adult thing and saying look you need to you need to calm down now and it'll be okay you're going to go to school you're going to stick it out and you're going to shine it on for a few more years because that's what a parent is supposed to do he's having a hard time with it because he doesn't i mean and he's basically entertaining this entertain the kid's behavior and this kid's telling him um you're allowing me to prance around like I'm an adult and make the, make and make very irresponsible decisions that I'm not old enough to make. Why aren't you put it laying down the law? And he's basically asking him, could you please be the parent and tell him and put me in my place and tell me no. And throughout the majority of the film, A Thousand Clowns, Murray does not tell the kid no. He actually sits there and lets him leave the house when he wants 
goes to the friend's house, he lets the kid behave like he's an adult, which is not something you're supposed to do, which is a part of the reason why he's under investigation from child services. And at this point in the film, if he doesn't get a job, he's going to lose custody of the kid. There he is, there's a little guy, look at him, little guy, I got a chuckle statue for you. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Herman. Imagine how pleased I am to receive it. It's a very artistic statue and very good cardboard, too. And I got a chuckle hat for you, just like the old chipmunk wears. Thank you. <laughs> You're wearing the Chuckles hat. You gotta say to Chuckles hello. The what? Chip, chip, chipper monkey. Oh yeah, sure. Chip, chip, chipper monkey. <laughs> May I know your first name? It's Nick most of the time. Most of the time. What I got here? Two big bags of Chuckle Chip potato chips. Huh? <laughs> Nicky. You want to put these crispy chips in a bowl or something for us? Oh. Yeah, and take your time, Nick, because your uncle and me got some, we got some grown-up talking to do. Okay, <laughs> the kid hates me. I didn't go over very well with him. I pushed a little too hard. Nice kid, Marty. Yeah, how are your kids, Leo? Fine, fine, but I swear to God, even they don't like my show since you stopped riding it. My youngest one, my six-year-old. Ralphie. Ralphie. Watches the Funny Bunny Show every morning now instead of me. Oh, have I been bombing out on the show every morning? You know what? I'm going to pause right there real quick. What's going on right here is that Murray's old job, which he walked out on because his boss is clearly arrogant and self-centered and is very really swelled up on his ego. Um, walks all over Murray and treats him like crap and base and is clearly very, very verbally abusive to him um, pretty much on a regular basis behind behind the scenes. And Murray probably got tired of it, but at the same time didn't I mean, he broke the bone, the one cardinal rule, which is, you know, you don't walk in on a job just because you're putting up with the, um, you're putting up with the boss. When you have custody of a kid and you've got mouths to feed, you have to keep that job no matter what. And it's at this point where basically, you know, the guy's coming to offer Murray's job back and He's now, he, oh, sorry, excuse me, um, where he's now, he's now coming to, to offer, his job, offer him his job back, but clearly his, um, where his nephew, Nick, does not, is not having it. He doesn't like the guy, but he's trying, basically he's being fake polite to him, which is what um, a lot of kids in that situation have done. They've been fake polite to their parents' boss or to various workers, and, you know, this is, this happens quite a bit. Um... So yeah, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of building, I'm kind of giving you giving you an idea that basically the guy works for the guy who has his own kids TV show. Where he says chip chip chipper monk, you know the whole. It's a common phrase that people know. And Murray used to write the show, and the show was very successful. He wrote it. However, clearly behind the scenes, he was very abusive to Murray and 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 everybody else who worked on the show. So. Yeah. This right here is this this right here what right here is building up is something that's very um, it, let's just say that what what it's building up to is very climactic in the film. Feels like the bomb out in front of children, you flop out in front of kids, Murray. I swear to God, they're ready to kill you, or else they stare at you. That's the worst. That hurt, innocent little stare, like you just killed that pup or raped that turtle or something, Murray. Have you back with me at the studio. See you at the show tomorrow. It's going to be beautiful. You're the best. I, I appreciate you feeling that way, Leo. This afternoon on the phone, you walked out on me. Uh, yeah, Leo. Why? Why, Why do you do sorry. No, I was only no, kidding. Now. I know. Right. I make people nervous. Who can listen to me for 10 minutes, right? You see that? You see that? See how I kept touching my, my suit, my tie like that? I keep touching myself to make sure I'm still here. I get this feeling. Maybe I vanished when I wasn't looking. No, I'm sure that you're here, Leo. See how he talks to me a little nasty? I like it. Straight, it's real, I like it. You know what I got around me on the show? Finks. Dwarfs, phonies, and frogs. 
No worries. The show is boring. Boring, boring. Boring, boring, boring. Boring, boring. Boring, boring. Boring, boring, boring. Murray? Boring, boring, boring. Boring, boring, boring. I believe that I left my files here. I came to get my files. May I have my files, please? Oh, excuse me. At Chuckles at Chipmunk, this is Minnie Mouse. Hi, Minnie. You must be Mr. Herman. I must be. I must be him. Well, I'll be on my way. That's a very attractive girl, that Minnie. What does she do? Uh, she's my decorator. All right, I'm going to pause right there. In the movie, Marie had a bad fight and argument with the worker, and she left, and she left her files there. But she left the files there on purpose because she knew that he, that he was going to have a possible job interview. And this is something that this is something that child services workers do quite a bit. They'll leave, they'll leave their bag, their hat, or their jacket, something behind to give them an excuse to come back to kind of catch to kind of catch the, the people in their case off guard in, in the event that they're either a not getting a job or b they're abusing a kid or c whatever. There's a lot of different reasons. That, there's a lot of different things that they can catch people people in the act of doing. So that one is that that that's one that that's done quite a bit. Um, Unfortunately, it happens more often than people than not, and it, it causes a lot of chaos. So, um, yeah, and you can clearly see that you know Mr. Herman is not buying the whole "she's my decorator" bit. He he knows something's up. He heard the words "case files" and he knew that there's something. There's a lot more that meets the eye. So, let's continue seeing. She's done a wonderful job. Place is great, Murray. It's loose, it's open, it's free. I love it. A wonderful, crazy place. <laughs> My God. You must make out like mad in a place like this, huh? <laughs> How is it I never came here before? You were here last January, Leo. You worked with me for three years. I never saw your apartment. You were here last January, Leo. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wasn't I here recently? In the winter? Last January, I think. I remember I came here to get you back on the show and you wouldn't listen to me. It was a week after you quit me. You walked into the kitchen and started singing, Yes, sir, that's my baby, and I left. Feeling very foolish, like I had footprints on my face. You're, oh. you're a monkey. You're a monkey. <laughs> you're an old monkey, aren't you, huh? Walked in the kitchen and started singing, Yes, sir, that's my baby. <laughs> you know what I got from that experience? A rash. I broke out something terrible. <laughs> Minnie Mouse. Minnie Mouse! You told me her name was Minnie Mouse! <laughs> I swear to God, I think my mission in life is to feed you straight lines. It's a kind of a fallout show, but that's what you got here, Mar. Protection against the idiots of the atmosphere. It's free, it's free, free, and free. It's Free, 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 free and free. Another year and I'll cut another year and I'll cut loose from that chipmunk. Chipmunk show. Blinds me, hugs me up, fakes, dwarfs, ponies, and frogs. Now the two of us, we gotta do something new, something wild. A new kind of kids show for adults, maybe. You told me the same thing three years ago, Leo. All right, why you want for me? I'm a coward. Everybody knows, oh my God. Did you ever see anything so immodest? I bring a big statue of myself as a gift for a child, huh? The pure ego of it? I'm ashamed, Murray, please. Throw a sheet over it or something, will you please? Oh, good, just kid Rooney's look at your poor chip of my friend. He got his mouth stuck. Oh, no matter how hard I try, I can't get my mouth unstuck. But maybe if you chipper monks yell, be happy, chuckle, maybe then you'll get unstuck. <laughs> you, you're supposed to yell, be happy, chuckle. Oh yeah, sure. Be happy, chuckle. That's <laughs> right, you fixed me. <laughs> I'm all fixed. <laughs> 
Yeah. Would you like your potato chips now, Mr. Herman? <laughs> That's a bit from tomorrow morning show. Yeah, you're gonna know it before all the kids in the neighborhood. Thank you. That's one of the funny parts there where I couldn't move my mouth. Oh, oh, yeah? You think it was funny? Sure, that was pretty funny. Yeah. Don't you laugh or something when you see something funny? Oh, yeah, it just caught me by surprise is all. I didn't get a chance. Don't you want more potato chips, mister? Another funny part was where I jumped up there with a smile there. At the end there. Was another one. He didn't the finish on a bit. I got the smile, see? Now I'm all fixed. Huh? Now I'm all fixed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, now it's stuck the other way. Oh, gee, that's terrific, Mr. Herman. That's all you got to do. Just get up there and do that and they pay you and everything. You didn't laugh. I was waiting for the funny part. That was the funny part. You mean when you fell on the floor? Yeah, we're going back on the floor there. Well, you see, the thing is, I... Yeah, I know. You were waiting for the funny part. Wait, well, yeah. You missed another funny part. Another one? I'm very sorry, Mr. Herman. I... I get it. I happen to know that the bit is very funny. Yeah, I can prove it to you. What does it say right there? Second line there. Brown bit, 85% of audience, outright prolonged laughter on Brown bit. That's an analysis report the agency did to me on Monday's preview audience. The routine I just did for you got outright prolonged laughter, 85%. Monday, 3 o'clock. You try on sad parts, Leo. He's very good on sad parts. As a matter of fact, there was a poignant type bit I did at the preview theater. 60% of audience noticeably moved. They left the theater. There he is. There's the old Joker, right? Huh? Hurry the Joker! Well, say, I can do some routines, too. Now, I can imitate the voice of Alexander Hamilton. Good. I do Alexander Hamilton. And Murray does a terrific Thomas Jefferson. We got the voices just right. Hello, Alex. How are you? Say hello, Tom. You know, you should have been in Congress today. Yeah. You really need it. So this is ridiculous. <laughs> You can't do an imitation of Alexander Hamilton. Nobody knows what he sounds like. <laughs> well, it's the funny part. You missed the funny part, Leo. I'm getting a terrible rash on my neck. I was working good in front of the kid. The routine I did for him was funny. I don't go over with these odd kids. But look, look at him. Here I am right in front of him in person. For God's sakes, he's staring at me. Oddness here, Murray. Oddness! Alexander Hamilton imitations. Jaded jokes for old men. What you've done to the kid is a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame the way you brought the kid up here. Grotesque atmosphere. Unhealthy. Women in and out. Decorated. Yeah. I've been brought up by a normal person. Not in this madhouse. Hey, don't say that. It's a certain freakish kind of growing up. Freakish way of growing up. Hey, are you calling me a freak? You called me a freak, now you take back what you said. On June the 3rd, I'll be 42 years old. I'm standing here arguing with a 12-year-old kid. Mickey. Humor is a cloudy wonderland thing. But simple and clear as the blue, blue sky. All I want is your simple, honest child's opinion of my routine. But children are too honest to be wise. Well, my simple child reaction of what you did is that you were not funny. Funnier than you is even Stuart Schlossman, who was my friend and is 11, and puts walnuts in his mouth and makes noises. What's not funny is to call us names. And what is mostly not funny is how sad you are. And I'd feel sorry for you if it wasn't for how dull you are. And those are the worst tasting potato chips I've ever tasted. And that's my opinion from the blue, blue sky. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there he is. There's the old mother. There's the old joker, right? 
You didn't want to come back to work for me. You got me up here and step on my face again. Yeah, Leo, Leo. Yes, sir, that's my baby no shirt. That's the song. That's a good song. That's my baby. Hey, hey, Leo. You don't work for nothing. Yes, Leo. 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 Leo.
the tongue in cheek, the, the kind of the, the tongue in cheek part of Holly Cary Grant kind of esque part of Hollywood, that uh, or the Catherine Hepburn as, aspect of Hollywood, you know, um, they threw that out the window. This is depicting real life, and what's really what really goes on. The whole scene is played out very accurately in the sense that this happens every single day. Even today that happens. You have parents who are forced to bow down to situations they don't like. And really right here you see finally see Murray stepping up to the plate and disciplining the kid and saying, No, enough's enough. Go back to your to your, to your, to your, little, to your little sleeping space. And as difficult as this is to watch, I give this 100% accuracy because this happens all the time. And um, as an advocate, I would tell him, you, you, play, you, you, did it, you, you did it right. I know this sucks, but you're, you're, you're going to get through it. So, yeah. Um, let's see the rest of the scene. sandwich right now, couldn't you? Uh, on rye with coleslaw and Russian dressing. Nick? Guy calls his name. Guy talks to us like that. Should have got rid of that moron. the welfare people or something. <sighs> Could have moved to Mexico, New Jersey, someplace. I hear the delicatessen in Mexico is terrible. Well, I'm going to call myself Theodore. Okay. As long as you don't call yourself Beatrice. Psychologically, if you want to analyze that. Of course, last month I left my handbag in the automat. I have no idea what that means at all. <laughs> I think that the pattern of our relationship, if we examine it, is very intricate. The different areas of it, especially the whole goodbye area of it, all right, I'm going to stop right there. This happens quite a bit. Where um, I've seen that this that this happens all, all quite a bit with, with families in this situation, where the parent has to make a hard decision and they have to make a tough choice for all the right reasons, and the kid, uh, the, the child, clearly clearly doesn't understand it. And now he's trying to make the kid understand that you know. And, w and when the worker comes in, and she's standing right there, right in front of them, as he, um, as Nick is asking, why'd you do that? We could have run. We could have gone anywhere. You know, we could have done, done anything. And he's telling him, it doesn't matter where we run. There's going to be another one of her no matter where we go. I have to be an adult. I have to be do the responsible thing and get a proper job and keep the job even if I hate it. And it's going to suck. It's going to be lousy. I'm going to go home and want to put my, and beat my head to, bed, head to the wall. 
but that's a part of being a parent, and that, that's what we have to. That's what we do. So yeah, I'm giving this one another. I'm, I'm giving this a very much 200% uh, accuracy rate. And you know there is no there there is no G-rated Full House type speech or um, Ozzy and Harry type of speech, you know, um, real family discussions and real hard you know, real hard um, parent child talks are like that. They're awkward. They're weird. And the kid asks, you know, they're they're not they're they're very not fun at all. So really, this, this I mean, it's almost a, 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 it's almost as if the dialogue and and the scene is bro is almost improvised. Because the movie, again, very much ahead of its time, very different from what you, you saw back in the 1960s. Um, and this ushered a new part of filmmaking, more realistic um, modes of dialogue that people really talk uh, talk about. It's as if almost somebody went into a real family's home and turned the cameras on and just and watched them behave. But yeah, this is, um, again, very ahead of its time, and... I give it about 100% accuracy. Very much 100% accuracy. Accuracy for you know the rhetoric of its day and you know the and the, and the practices of a social worker, but um, also 100% accuracy as to what happens when a parent is forced to step up to the plate and comply with what what, um, what, what the welfare system wants what, 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 what wants them to do. Sandy, how are you? Hi, Harry. I called the weather lady before. She says it, it is a beautiful day. Say, hey, lady, can I help with any of that? As a matter of fact, Nick. Nick, I do not think the effect, I mean the overall design of this room is really helped by all these knickknacks. Hmm. You mean the junk? Yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's not good for the overall design. So, Nick, if you would just help me put the uh, junk into those cartons over there. Nick! Wilbur. Wilbur Malcolm Burns. <laughs> disappointed in the really poor turnout at this morning's community scene. I mean... And finally, Paul, with the worker and Nick getting rid of all the access amounts of junk that Murray surrounds himself with, which clearly shows he's, he's got classic signs of bipolar disorder. Um... If, uh, the, the kid finally gets a normal parent who's act, who's going to be a parent and stop who's going to be uh, who's going to be his parent and stop being his friend because initially at the end of the day all Nick wants is Murray to be a, a parent so make this house a house this is not this is, this is not um, a museum this is not a place where people entertainers are this is this is a home and that's initially what they want they want it to remain a home. So really, I mean, the movie, the movie all around, it shows the worker having um, the, the the welfare worker or the child services worker um, succeeding in, in her task of getting him to get a normal job and to, and to basically conform with the way things really are and to be a responsible parent. Um, yeah, I give a thousand clowns about um, a 95% in uh, in, in in ethical pride and ethical accuracy for as to how the human services um, system works but um, I give it um, a minus 10 on the fact that you know there was a little bit of a romance thing going on between Jason Robards and the uh, and, and the worker <clears throat> so either way a thousand clowns is very much a movie I would recommend seeing. I would recommend peer advocates watching it, social workers watching it, and people and people you know who are in trouble with the child services system 
have them watch it to get an idea as to you want to sit there and you want to beat CPS, this is what you got to do. So a thousand clowns, I would very much, I would very much give it them. I would give it a again a 95 percent inaccuracy. It's just there's only that there's a lucky five percent missing of the whole romance thing going on because that never took place at all. But yeah, either way, I would say from an advocate standpoint, um, I would have fought to have him medicated, um, not hospitalized, but therapy. Have him get therapy, um, get him get him get medicated, get a life coach, or or just have him go to a support group to adjust to action um, to to, um, to to a life support group. Basically, to help him adjust to being in you know, a normal, to kind of surrendering to. Having a job you're gonna hate, and that's kind of what we, a lot of people do. So, an issue, what, what, what you could tell is that Nick is relieved that Murray is now finally, you know, being a parent and is supposed to being is supposed to being. What time? Would you uh, what you see is that Nick is finally? Must have came in after I left. Yes, eleven. Oh, okay, so I came in after I left. Oh, yeah, you went through that. Because I came, I was here at 10. Still quarter to 10. Oh. So they, uh, they are killing. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Uh -huh. All right. Basically, I would say, from an advocate standpoint, Murray and Murray just need a little bit more help. Um, she handled the situation accurately. She, she handled it properly. However, again, again, from an ad, from an advocate standpoint, I'd say you know um, he needs he um, that, that the guy needs medication and therapy and needs some serious help. But yeah, I would recommend watching the movie, and it, would, it was very much ahead of its time. And I don't think he was ever seen movies that actually have an accurate portrayal of um, the child services system. This is one of the only ones of its kind. This movie there is made for TV movies, but this is the first movie that was in theaters. And there's not enough movies like that. Anyway, this is a member of the Voice of Reason, having a lot of fun, having advocated um, a thousand clowns. I'd recommend anybody to watch it. Um, it's a very good movie. And, you know, just what it does is it gives a very accurate portrayal as to what, what it's like being on the receiving end of a child services worker. But the, the, the more disturbing part is the fact that was when, um, when the person who's on the receiving end can't grow up and just stop. Anyway, this is a member of the voice of reason. Aho.